Uh, my name is Dick Frizzell and I'm an artist, illustrator, designer. I had just gone out freelancing from advertising and I needed income. And, uh, but illustrating, like I thought, could, and I was doing a lot of commercial illustration, you know, which is different sort of kettle of fish. And I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll have a go. And I did it and I sent it to Vanya. And she, she said, oh, that's good. It was a, a story of pirates, I remember. And um, she sent me another one and another one and another one. And then I just, that became the thing, you know. I just got into it. The, my work was quite, was very old fashioned. I was still influenced by the other generation of school, like E. Mervyn Taylor and Russell Clark and uh, or th that generation. And so all my um, black and white work had a slightly quaint old-fashioned look about it and it was only when it went when they they they'd suddenly went to colour I mean it was a huge announcement we're going to colour you know what I mean and so there, there was an explosion of colour and creativity you know all of a sudden my kids went from wearing grey shorts and Roman sandals to wearing blue jeans and sneakers I mean almost overnight it was quite bizarre the, what was new was a you're getting you're getting stories from people like Margaret Mayhe and they just going whoa shit you know what I mean I better make an effort with this one I had no ambition to be an illustrator a famous illustrator or whatever you know I was just doing them so I wasn't worried about continuity and I wasn't worried about a Dick Frizzell style I wasn't worried about evolving a look or a reputation or I was just doing them you know everything was new especially that, that, um, that colour thing. And, uh, and the fact that I had little kids myself and I was use, using them as models a lot, I'd get, you know, if I had to get a tricky shot of a kid climbing up a ladder you know, to get into his tree house, I'd get the kids to get up a step ladder and or, you know, I had a Polaroid camera that I could take reference snaps with and things like that. Without kind of realising it, I was learning a lot about that pragmatic approach to working rather than, I mean, I, I never overlaid an aesthetic idea onto a story. The story was always the story. If the story was a Japanese folk story, I would illustrate it in the style of a kind of Japanese folk story, you know what I mean? I'd, so I, play, I was playing all the time. No one said, oh, these, they're all too messy, too different. Um, no one gave a shit about that. They just wanted the, them to look good. I had certain illustrators that I felt that it was like they were like alter egos. There was one guy called Basso from, who did a lot of electric company stuff. So I, I would do some journals, some stories that come along. I like there'd be comic strips and journal stories. Or, I'd go, oh, that'd be a Basso story, I think. You know, I'd adopt my Basso personality for that one. I mean, quite seriously, I'd become Basso, really, in as much as I could totally understand every trick that he used and I could become it, you know. I had one fantastic editorial, well it wasn't even editorial, it was bigger than that. There was a, a bloke, a writer called Sydney Melbourne, and he had this uh, whiz-bang idea that he was, because there were Maori language journals were starting to come in, and he's, the problem was getting the k school kids, you know, like at Upper Hut, Intermediate or whatever, to read them, to bother, he said, let's do all the Maori legends in the Marvel comic style, which I thought was fantastic because I was a Marvel comic nut. I had been, I'd been buying them ever since the first Spider-Man came out. So Maori was like, you know, Thor with all his sinews popping out of his body and everything else. And, he, and the patu was like Thor's hammer and it was, everything was crash, bang, wallop, and there was blood and, you know, it's, and saliva coming out of the side of these, of the, the, Maori, the, the Maori villains with their top knots and feathers and blood and vomit. And um, it worked. These kids were reading this stuff like you wouldn't believe. They couldn't wait for the next one to come out. And meanwhile, the, 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 uh, the the senior editors, the ones at the top in charge of everything, who are all sort of old retired headmasters and stuff who hated comics because they've been confiscating them all their lives. And they just couldn't, oh, they, they sort of were like this with these things, trying to cope with it. And then we got to the end, the part of the Maori legends where he walks back into his mother's vagina and they, and they just put, they stopped it. They just pulled the plug.
on the whole thing. And we had um, Sydney had it all written, and I never, I never even got as far as it, 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 it researching or drawing it. They thought I'm not going to have, they were not going to have Frizzell draw that. <laughs> as I said, even though they were just school journals, you know, so to speak, there's no way I'd treat it lightly when you do it. You know, every job, everything that's thrown at you, that you decide that you're going to do. Well, just do it well, you know. And that was the thing about the journals. There, in New Zealand, there was no, there's no comic book industry. You couldn't go over there and be a comic book artist, even if you wanted to be. I did want to be one. It offered me that opportunity, because a, a lot of it was comic strip style, and I got, oh good, a comic strip. You know what I mean? So I just love all that. I still do. I mean, a, a comic strip in the newspaper, or whatever. That's the first thing I look at. Yeah. <laughs>